Good evening. Uh, I'm starting today a new series. Uh, it's called Ikare Emuna, the principle, the foundation of the faith, which I find that many people have very, very big problems with understanding the principles. That's why it caused so many confusion everywhere. So this series is sponsored by Ilu Nishmat Mazal Bat Ksiya, Pinchasov, Alea Shalom. Also, I want this lecture to be Leilui Nishmat Avram ben Ephraim Zubli in Leilui Nishmat Gedalia ben Yaakov Alevi and Nezivu uh, Gagun Lemordechai ben Lori and also the Daniel ben Ilana and the Refuat Chaim Alexander ben Frida Milka and the Refuat Shlema of Rivka Bat Yafa and Yoel Yaakov Israel ben Avraham Avin. After we cover the names, we can start, Baruch Hashem. Most of what we know of the 13th principle of Judaism, Shlosha Asari Karim Shela Yadut, comes mainly from the Rambam. The Rambam actually collected all the information for us, concentrate everything to 13 major principles. Of course, there's other principles if you learn Torah. It's much more than 13, but the 13 are crucial. What does it mean crucial? If a non-Jew come, and he wants to join the Jewish nation, wants to convert to Judaism. The first thing you ask them is what are the 13 principles of Judaism? After they, they announce the entire 13 principles of Judaism, one by one, they have to know everything by heart. They also have to believe in it 100%. If they say that they believe in 12 out of the 13, you cannot convert them. Why? It's like building a building. The architect, the engineer, when he wrote the blueprint, he decided that the building has to stand on 13 poles. If you remove one pole out, the entire building will collapse. Just a matter of time. That's serious negligence. Same thing over here. If one, or if they say, I believe in 12, but one I don't believe. For instance, I don't believe in reward and punishment. You're not allowed to convert them. Uh, I don't believe the Mashiach would ever come. They don't allow, you're not allowed to convert them. I don't believe there's going to be such thing, resurrection of the dead. You're not allowed to convert them. I don't believe that Moses is the greatest prophet ever lived. You're not allowed to convert them. I don't believe there's only one God, maybe there are others. You're not allowed to convert them. There will be an illegal conversion. They may come and say, the Goy, wait a minute, I have a Jewish friend. He has a very nice beard and a sombrero. He also doesn't believe in reward and punishment. He said that uh, we don't know. There's no such thing punishment by Hashem. He's also an infidel. Doesn't matter that he has a nice beard and tzitzit and he goes to a shul. There are many, many infidels, <laughs> many, many heretic Jews. Some of them Bachure Shivot. Bachure Shivot. Their, their ideology is so corrupted that you cannot call them Jews. If you check their knowledge and their beliefs, now forget about you cannot call them religious. You cannot call them Jews. They don't follow the main principle of Judaism. One of the best examples of our days is the followers of Santa Claus. He's very popular. He has thousands of thousands of followers. Who admire him, invites him to events. He's the biggest heretic in the whole world. No one is more heretic than him. Person who declare a war against God wrote a book to, to start a war against Hashem and all his principles in the Torah. The more terrible, bad things he does, the more followers he has. Why is it? Because the Satan is interested that people would lose their Olam Abba. Someone follows such a Rasha, 
immediately he loses olam haba. It's not a joke. If someone follows Shabtai Tzvi, a very big serious problem. If someone follows Yeshayahu Levovich, Shem Reshaim Yerkav, he loses olam haba. Anyone who follow a reform, what they call themselves rabbi, I don't know how they have the nerve to call themselves rabbi when they don't keep one mitzvah. Rabbi have to keep mitzvot. You know rabbi that doesn't keep one mitzvah? One. And they still call themselves rabbi, or a woman call herself rabbi. If he follows such a leader, obviously he cannot call him a kosher Jew. So when it comes to reform, or all these goyim, or shabtai tzvi that converted to Islam bechlal in the end, Obviously, you know these people are fools. The problem begins when they follow someone that has a beard and a black hat and it looks very orthodox. That's when the venom goes smoothly into the souls of the listeners and destroys their soul. You don't know, you don't understand how dangerous it is to listen to some of those horrible heretics people in my black list. It's enough, you listen to them five minutes, and it destroys your soul. Five minutes. Can't look at their face. You're not allowed to look at them, even in a picture. Someone show you, oh, you know, a picture or a flyer, you're not allowed to look. You have to delete it immediately. Can't look in their face. These are people who took the Torah, the pure, 100% truth Torah of God, and turned them into mockery. Destroy it. Complete, destroy the principles, destroys everything that are written over there. So when people like this do it, they're simply very wicked, very wicked people. They want popularity, they try to be special, I don't know why they're doing it. Maybe they are the souls of the Erev Rav, some demons behind what they do, okay. The problem, I feel bad for all the, for all the ignorant people. It's a lot of ignorant people, don't know any Torah, nothing. Some of them Bali Tshuva, they get hunted by these evil, malicious speakers and their soul is destroyed. Sometimes people say, yeah, but he said about this, that's true. He said, I spoke about that, that's true. This one was very inspiring. This one, this one, hundred percent, you also say it. I don't understand. In order for someone to hunt and destroy your soul, it cannot be 100 percent false. If everything he said will be false, no one would listen. Even the dumbest people will realize something is off here. So the Satan arranged that they will speak 70, 80 percent the truth, and the 20, 30 percent that they push with their nonsense and the terrible ideology, that's what destroys the people. For instance, you can talk to your whole thing about the parasha, read to you Rashi, say to you what the Rambam say, can name the all kinds of rebels, and in the end, five sentences in his entire speech destroys your soul, make you feel that there's no such thing punishment. You leave the lecture and you say, you know what? It's all bad luck. It's not really the hand of Hashem. Why did I have an accident? It's not my sins. I'm not responsible for that. This is what Hashem wanted. We don't know why. That's enough. Once you begin to think like that, you're a heretic. Can I count you in a minyan? That's why it's so important to do this series. I don't know how many lectures it's going to be. I don't know. We will see as we progress. I didn't even prepare it. I just grabbed a book and decided that we have to do it. Why? Because I see how naive people are. It's just like talking to the world because they don't have the principles. They don't have the foundation. We will teach, most of what we teach comes from the Rambam. Why the Rambam? Because the Rambam, unanimously, is accepted by all kinds of Jews. Sfaradim, Ashkenazim, Hasidim, Temanim. If you look at the Jewish nation today, you can divide them to four groups. Yemenites, Temanim, they have their tradition. You have Ashkenazim, Ashkenaz. And then you have Hasidim, which comes also from Ashkenaz, but they are different because they follow Kabbalah. And the Sfaradim, Sfaradim, Sfarad. And then you have the fifth kind, which is secular Jews. Even they accepted the Rambam. They don't know a word of what the Rambam wrote, because if they would really read the words of the Rambam, they would burn his books, the Chilonim. 
the secular Jews, all you, all you need is to show them five, six things the Rambam spoke about them. Immediately they will burn his books and change all the schools in Israel that name after him to different name. And all the streets in Israel that are named after him, they will change immediately. And all the hospitals that are named Bet Cholim Rambam, immediately they change. Because the Rambam called the Chiloinim 100% Goim. He called them Mishumadim. You cannot count them as Jews. You cannot count them in a minyan. If they slaughter an animal, you're not allowed to eat. It's not kosher meat. He actually said in few places that they are worse than the Goim. Do you think the Chilonim in Israel that admire the Rambam, if they would read that according to his books, they are considered worse than idol worshippers, do you think they will continue to admire the Rambam? Why they admire the Rambam? Because they know he was a great doctor. That's it. For that, they admire him, but they don't know what he spoke about them. If they would know, believe me, it would be illegal in Israel to touch his books. I don't know. But surprisingly, even they accepted the Rambam. So, oh, Rambam said, oh, they give respect. So no one, no one really argues against the Rambam. Everyone accepted him. No wonder he's the greatest prosek in the last thousand years. More than 90% of the halachot in Shulchan Aruch is from the Rambam. More than 90%. How the Shulchan Aruch was written? Shulchan Aruch was written by a great legendary rabbi, his name was Rabbi Yosef Karo. He was a Sfaradi rabbi that came from Spain in the time of the Spanish Inquisition and Portuguese, 500 years ago. He went to Eretz Israel. He settled in the city of Tzfat, all the way in the north by the border of Syria in Lebanon. He settled there in Tzfat, and in those years he wrote the Shulchan Aruch, the Jewish book of law. Of course, nothing over there comes from him as just concluding hundreds of years of halachot that were all over the world, in Europe, in, in, in the Middle East. What did he do? Since there were hundreds of big rabbis before him, hundreds of Rishonim, you know, he, he, there was no end to it. Like the Krashi and all the Baalei Atosafot and the Ran and the Orzarua, so many. It's never gonna end. First of all, don't forget, there was no printing yet. That was the beginning of print. They started to print Shulchan Aruch after, the, after the Rabbi Yosef Karo. That was one of the first books they printed. It was manually very, very primitive. They used to take pieces of metal in the shape of a letter, dip it in ink, put them in a line, and brings the whole tablet down. It was, uh, <laughs> it was all crooked. It wasn't like today, everything. The computer print a book in less than a minute. The entire book. It was a different world. People didn't have books. So Rabbi Yosef Karo, barely with what he had, was able to write Shulchan Aruch. So obviously he's not going to gather hundreds of different books, of different ones. Remember, it was all by handwriting. So what, what did he do? He took the top three. Well, the Torah said to follow that when there's this disagreement in Halacha, you follow the majority. But the majority not in quantity. The majority in quality. There's no end. If you want to do majority in quantity, it's, it's not realistic. You have to gather all the big rabbis in the world and start making a vote. What do you think? This is allowed or not allowed? 200 say not allowed, 500 say allowed. Okay, we write in Shulchan Aruch, it's allowed. It's not realistic. There's no telephone, no computers, no emails, no printing. Impossible to get all the information and to put everything, everyone in one room. So what did he do? He took the top three. The Rif, uh, the Rav El Fassi from Morocco, who lived almost a thousand years ago. The Rambam, who lived almost 900 years ago. And the Rosh, the Rosh, Rabbeinu Asher, two Sfaradim, one Ashkenazi. And uh, he gathered all the Psakim and he went two against one. If it's all three ruled, Allowed or not allowed, all three unanimously, no question. That's the halacha. If two say allowed, one say not allowed, follow the majority. If uh, two say not allowed, one say allowed, follow the majority. With some exception to the rule. Usually always went by the majority of the three, which is top three. Few times when the minority, he went with the minority because 
many other, dozens other, would be like him. So he felt in this particular case we have to do an exception to the rule. But almost everywhere it's majority. That's it. Shulchana, once it was ruled, it was accepted in all the communities. The Ashkenazim, remember, they were following their tradition 500 years before the Shulchan Aruch was written. Now, the rabbi of the Shulchan Aruch is Sfaradi. His minagim, his customs are according to Edota Mizrach, Sfaradim, people that came from Spain. But there were people in Germany, there were people in England, there were, there were rabbi in, uh, in, uh, in uh, France, Rashi and Baalei Atosafot, many big chachamim in France. So they had their own tradition, different customs. So once the Shulchan Aruch was written, there was a very big Ashkenazi rabbi, Rabbi Moshe Iserlish, it's called the Rama, that's the abbreviation of his name, the Rama. He wrote on the Shulchan Aruch, on every provision, if the Ashkenazim have different customs, he wrote it. The Ashkenazim used to do like this, that's it. And the Ashkenazim followed those comments. Most of the places, it's the same halacha, same, Sfaradim, Ashkenazim, same. Places the Ashkenazim used to do different, he just made a comment over there in the Shulchan Aruch. He lived very short life, 33 years, and already was a huge chacham, 33 years. People lived a short life in those days. All kinds of pandemic, there was no antibiotic, didn't have the vaccines of today. If something happened, it was a pandemic, you hear, you read in the books, a lot of big, great people died in a pandemic. It used to be a common thing, all these pandemics. And this is a little bit background when it comes to that. So most of the halachot in Shulchan Aruch, in the end, was aligned with the ruling of the Rambam. This is just to give you an, an example, who was the Rambam? Rabbi Moshe ben Maimon. He had a son, was also very big chacham, Rabbi Avraham also. His father was Maimon also. So he comes, the Rambam, Rambam was also a doctor of the king of Egypt, the Sultan. The Rambam used to take care of Arabs all day. He writes, today I didn't have time to eat my lunch. All day I was taking care of these Arabs, all these anti-Semite Nazis. He had to take care of them. While most of his time was taking care of these monsters, who I don't have to tell you how much they hate Jews, but when they need a doctor, they know very well to come only to Jews, the Arabs. When they need a doctor when it comes to their life or the life of their children, they do everything they can to send the terrorists into Israel that the Israeli will operate on their people. They don't count on their Arab doctors. All these Hamas monsters, including Sinwar, were cured by Israelis. If the stupid Israelis would not try to be too liberal and take care of these Nazis, maybe we wouldn't have October 7. The architect of, of October 7, Ezekiel Sinwar in Machshimo, he was almost dead. Another week he would be dead. The Israelis saved his life with a brain operation. After they saved his life, he told them, thank you very much, but I'm going to do even better now to destroy all of you. This is their gratitude. The more you do for them, they look at it as a weakness. When you have a kosher person, when you do a favor to a kosher person, he appreciates. He has gratitude, akarat atov. The Torah says someone who doesn't have akarat atov is worse than a monster. Hashem cannot look at him. Kfui tova, katuv mashiv tachat tova lo tamush mi beto. Someone that receives good and return bad in return. Someone like that, Hashem can look at him. Bad will not come out of his home. And you can see a perfect example. They're willing to suffer hell on earth. To see their house destroyed. Their furniture destroyed. All their passports, documents, wedding pictures. All kinds of holiday pictures, everything destroyed with bombs from Israeli planes. They know it's coming. Just to kill one Jew on a bus stop. It's for them the whole world. Better than to win the lottery. You ask any one of them, what would you prefer? To murder one Jew, blow up his head? Or to win the lottery, $200 million? 
Almost all of them would say to, to kill a Jew. I'm willing to pay millions to kill one Jew. It's the proof. Look, Gaza is all destroyed now. They're not regretting what they did. If you ask them, let's go back to October 6th, would you do what you did, seeing what you did to your entire city? Absolutely, with no hesitation. No hesitation. They have one purpose, to be the demon and the Satan of the world. Just to torture people, first Jews, then Christians, and then others. They also torture their own people. But that's all they want, just to destroy the others. It doesn't matter what they pay. It doesn't matter how much they suffer. It doesn't matter they, they lose their children, they lose their wives, they lose their husbands, they're going to sit in jail 20, 30 years. It doesn't matter. As long as we kill one Jew, we're happy. That's why I always say that they're much worse than the Nazis. Because the Nazis, as much as they hate the Jews, they would not agree to lose one finger to kill a Jew. You come to any Nazi, tell them you can kill a, a thousand Jews in press of a button, but you're going to have to lose one finger. You're going to have nine fingers from now on for the rest of your life. No, no Nazi would agree such thing. You're going to lose an arm. No one would agree. You come to them, lose a finger. I'm willing to lose myself and my ten sons to kill one Jew. You're talking to me about finger? Me and my ten sons will explode, all of us together, to kill one Jew. But no hesitation. You didn't have that by the Nazis or by any other enemy. I don't think in the history of the world he had such thing. And by the way, the King David, with one of his prophecies in Tehillim, in Psalms, he said that the last enemies we will have before the arrival of the Messiah will be like the bees. The bees. What does it mean, the bees? What's special about a bee when a bee stings a person? What happened to the bee? He dies. The bee knows I'm going to use my poison to attack someone knowing I'm going to die. The bee stings, the bee dies, and it's, and it's still doing it. That's exactly David Amelech 3,000 years ago who said the end of days, the enemies we'll have will be like bees. And they're willing to die just to kill you or just to hurt you. The bee won't kill you. Most of the time, if you're not allergic, you won't die. You just suffer for a few hours. That's it. The bee is willing to die to make you suffer. And that's exactly how they are. And there's nothing you can do about it. An enemy is not afraid to die. There's not that much you can do. What are you going to do? Threaten them? They don't care. You destroy their home. They make a party. You knock down a building. They don't care. They're just happy. Happy. As long as we hurt the Jews, we're happy. This is the situation we live in. As sad as it is, it's a part of the plan. Once you know all of that was written, <laughs> you have to be blind not to see the end of Hashem. So going back to our subject, so the Rambam was taking care of them. He writes, today I didn't have time to eat all day. All day I was taking care of these Arabs, the Ishmaelim. And after he was taking care of them day after day, night after night, he still became the greatest posek in the last thousand years. Imagine what a legend he was. Imagine if he didn't have to take care of these Arabs. He would sit and learn Torah non-stop, every day, all his life, like other Chachamim, like Rashi and Baalei Tosafot and other Rishonim. Imagine who he would be. Years he had to burn and taking care of these anti-Semite Nazis. Years of his life he had to take care of them. Why? Because if, not, if you won't do it, they'll kill him. Not that much you can do there. So, you know, just to give us an example of who is the Rambam is, for people to understand, when you say we base the series on the Rambam, it gives you a little preview on who the Rambam was. The Rambam writes, in the end of chapter 8, in Ilchot Melachim, the Rambam wrote a few books. The most important one is Mishne Torah, Ayad Chazaka. Mishne Torah. He wrote it, it took him 30 years to write it. He wrote it in Lashon HaKodesh. All his other books were written in Arabic. But when it came to Halakha, Halakha, the law, has to be precise. Exactly like it's written in the Talmud. If you would write it in a foreign language, it can be interpreted to different ways. He meant this way, he meant that way. Other books, 
uh, wasn't as critical because it's not allowed or not allowed. Here, here you're going to commit a sin. He had to write it in Lashon HaKodesh. While he was a servant of all these Arabs, he was able to write for 30 years the book Mishneh Torah. In the end of Mishneh Torah, the last chapter is Ilchot Melachim, the loves of the kings. Talks about days of Mashiach, what's going to happen in the end of days. Very interesting. In the end of chapter 8, this is what he writes, Halacha Yud. End of chapter 8, the tenth halacha in a chapter. Moshe Rabbeinu lo inchi la Torah va mitzvot ela le Israel. Moshe Rabbeinu gave the Torah directly to whom? To the Jewish nation, no other nation. Other nations didn't come to participate in Ma'amad Ar Sinai, in acceptance of the Torah. As it's written, Morasha Torah Tzivalanu Moshe, Torah Moshe commanded us, Torah Tzivalanu Moshe, Moshe commanded us the Torah. Morasha, what does it mean Morasha? Inheritance, Yerusha. Morasha Keilat Yaakov. To the community, the family of Jacob. Who is Jacob? Israel. Only the children of Jacob. Any Gentile that wants to convert from other nations, right? He would consider to be a ger. There are two kinds of gerim. You have ger tzedek and you have ger toshav. What's the difference between the terms? When you occupy Israel, there are goyim that lives there. All of them are from seven cursed nations. The Torah said not to have mercy on them. The Torah said not to make peace with them, not to make agreements with them. They're all idol worshippers. God cannot look at them. They worship fake gods. There's nothing Hashem hates more than idol worshippers. Look at all the tsunamis, all the earthquakes, all the tragedies. What countries they hit the most? Thailand, Tibet, Nepal, Japan, China. Places of a lot of idol worship. India, lots of disasters. There's a lot of disasters, natural disasters. Why? Idol worshiping. There are a few things that make Hashem very angry. Abomination, toeva, homosexuality, uh, gay marriage, all kinds of parades, idol worshipping, it's all toeva. Nothing Hashem hates more than these things. Places like this receive a lot of tragedies. Look at what happened in Israel. Since they started to do these abomination parades, Every year, here and there, all kinds of places, Israel is sinking more and more every year. We are now a lot worse than what we used to be 30 years ago. We should have been a lot greater today. We are basically half destroyed already. Another two, three months like that, the country is finished. Why we don't have Siat Adishmaya? Because of this field. They fill up the land with abomination, and the Gemara say that because of that, natural disaster come to the place. Natural disaster can be earthquake, can be floods, can be fire. And Israel had a lot of fires, if you follow the news. And it could be a war with lots of casualties. From all what we had, Hashem chose this option. One way or the other, it's a disaster. Whether it's an earthquake, whether it's massive fire, whether it's uh, other things, it's all a disaster. Disaster, it's a disaster. So, <laughs> the Rambam say there are two kinds of gerim. Ger tzedek and ger toshav. What's the difference? When you come to Israel and you occupy the land, you don't immediately kill the idol worshippers over there. You tell them, we give you an option to repent. Stop with your idols, destroy them, we will give you permission to stay here and to live here and to keep the seven laws of Noah, which every Gentile in the world is obligated to keep. 
by the laws of God. Everybody must keep those seven laws. Through this series, we will talk about them. If the Gentiles agree, destroy their idols, and say, that's it, we're going to keep the seven laws and we'll be righteous Gentile, you give them residence. You're allowed to stay in the land of Israel. You're not allowed to break the laws of the Torah in public. You cannot break Shabbat on the streets. You cannot make fire on the street. You cannot, you cannot ride a horse on Shabbat. You cannot do things that Jews are not allowed to do on Shabbat in the streets. But you can do in your house whatever you want. You want to cook in your house, you go, you're allowed to cook. You want to eat not kosher, you eat not kosher. Whatever you do, as long as you're not an idol worshiper. Because idol worshiping is death penalty for Jews and for Gentiles. It's no difference. For both. Okay, no discrimination. Any idol worshiper is despicable in the eyes of God. Even if his father is a rabbi. It doesn't matter. Even if he keeps Shabbat. Even if he keeps all the laws of the Torah, but he believes his rabbi is a god, like some Jews here. Bow down to the chair of the dead rabbi, bow down to his grave, say he never die, he runs the world, he's a matchmaker to our children, he finds them soulmates. They are 100% idol worshippers. No difference between them and the Indian who bow down to the cow in India. Both of them are guilty with the crime of idol worshipping. Doesn't matter they have a beard and a black hat and tzitzit, it doesn't make any difference. Once you're an idol worshipper, you're an idol worshipper. And that's it, it's a death penalty. So it's interesting, you may have an Arab terrorist donating to the Hamas or to Hezbollah, support murders of children and women, and is not as guilty as someone with a beard and a tzitziot that is an idol worshipper. Meaning his punishment for supporting murder is lower than the punishment of a Jew with a yarmulke that is an idol worshipper. Who worship his dead rabbi. Most people don't have the guts to say it, but that's 100% the truth. I will not dare to say it unless I know 1 million percent that that's the halacha. Unfortunately, this is the way we are in today. Some people worship dead rabbis. By the way, you know, Shabtai Tzvi made himself a cult over 200 years ago in the area of Turkey over there. When Shabtai Tzvi, in the end of his life, converted to Islam, his followers until today follow him, worshiping until today, 200 years after he he became a goy completely when he converted to Islam. There are still Shabtaim in the world. Yeah, I cannot believe it. Meaning, Reshaim al Pitcha shel Geenom enam shavim b'tshuva. You show them, you show them that their entire life was an error. They refuse to change. The ego. They can't, they can't go back. The Satan cover them completely from all direction with the horrible ego. They refuse to repent. Say, yeah, what happens to you? There's nothing you can do about it. That's why when people tell me, oh, you're not going to believe I went to this place and they, they say this and they say that, I say, don't waste a minute talking to them. It's mamash a pure waste of time. It's a lost case. Don't waste time. Chaval. It's, it's a false argument. Create hatred, create problems. I remember when uh, Rabbi Shaulov came one time to New York, we met, he had a lecture in Brooklyn and I had a lecture. It was Tuesday night. We decided to get together after. And uh, when we came out of the restaurant, it was late at night, 1, 1 a.m. maybe. I saw him standing with a few guys on the street and starting to argue with them. They say what they say, he answer. He was uh, not understanding yet the situation that we have here. I said to him, you're wasting your time. It's not going to end until tomorrow morning. It's a false argument. There's no point. No, how can it be? Look what they say. Look what they... Can you believe what they just say? I said to him, you know what? I realize it's not going to end. I said to him, ask them one question. Who is greater? 
דה רבי או משה רבנו. He looks at me, זה מה? אתה נורמלי? Are you normal? איזה אסקסטם? כמה, איזה קנו, מה, באמת? I say, you don't believe me? Go and ask. המזרחי, נו, באמת. Come on, what are you saying? Why you argue? Go and ask. He asked them, tell me, with all due respect to your tzaddik rabbi, who's greater, him or Moshe Rabbeinu? Of course, our rabbi. You don't know who he was. That's the situation. And it's not one or two. We're talking tens of thousands of people here. So I want everyone to know, I say what I say. If you want to believe, you believe. If you don't want to believe, you ignore what I say. It's up to you. It's on you. But at least I know when I come in front of Hashem, He won't be able to tell me on this particular matter, you didn't do enough. Because I said it many times over the years. I got myself a lot of enemies for that. Many of them would like to see me dead. No problem, I take it to consideration. It's part of the job. Many Muslims want to see me dead when I speak about their false religion. Many gays want to see me dead when I speak about the horrible abomination. Many Mechalalei Shabal wants to see me dead when I speak about what's waiting for them in the next world, in Gehenom. So that's a, that's, a, that's a part, you know how they say, that's the cost of doing business. In my particular case, that's the cost of speaking the truth of the Torah. You will always get yourself enemies. And if you don't, that means you're not a kosher speaker. If you don't have any enemies, meaning whatever you say, everyone agree, you are for sure fake. If everyone hates you, you fake. If everyone loves you, you fake. If some love you, some hate you, there is a chance you're real. No guarantee. But there is at least a chance you're real. Remember what I say again. Everyone hates you, you fake for sure. Everyone loves you, for sure you fake. Some love you, some hate you, there is a chance you're real. Now let's examine what you say and check if you're real or not. If everybody loves you, then Chalilei Shabbat admire you. You're not doing the job, you're not rebuking anyone. You're not getting on their nerve. You're not telling them what's waiting for them. Of course they love you. Every day they would want someone to kiss up to them and tell them how great they are. Every murderer wanted the police to tell him what a great citizen he is. Right? Do you know how the murderers always blame the police? Corrupt, corrupted cop, he set me up. I'm, guilt, I'm innocent, I'm not guilty. We know that. So what there is an option we give to the converts, we tell them, you stop with your idol worshipping and you can stay to live in Israel. If they refuse, they have to leave. If they refuse to leave and they start a war, you start a war with them. But you always give them one direction open to run. You don't surround them with four directions. You surround them from left and right and from the front. But the back, you always keep open. You don't make a complete ambush around. Why? You rather them running away from the land of Israel instead of staying there and contaminate the land like they did. It's all verses in the Torah. The Torah say that we have no permission to make peace with them, to tolerate their idol worshipping, not allowed to marry them, not allowed to have any mercy on them. And uh, it's very interesting because there is a verse, do not dare to behave like them in any way. Lo telchu bechukot agoyim asher anochi meshalach mipnechem ki et kol atoevot ha'el asu agoyim ha'ele va'akutz bam. I don't give you permission to look like them in anything. Whatever they do, you have to be different than them in your haircuts, in your clothing. You're not allowed to mix with them. You're not allowed to marry them. You're not allowed to tolerate anyone. You have to destroy their idols. You have to destroy the bottom of their idol. If the idol was standing on the sand, you have to dig it with the sand that was under it. Even the sand is contaminated. If they had a, st a stage, stages that they put their idols on it, destroy that stage as well. It was a base to an idol. But you allow them to run away. 
Always let your enemy run away better than to run and kill him. Run from the land. You come out of the land, we close the border, goodbye. If they refuse and they stay to fight, you're not allowed to have any mercy on them. Lot you're not allowed to keep them alive. No mercy on these idol worshippers. Remember, there's no discrimination. Jewish idol worshippers and Gentile idol worshippers, both of them are huge criminals in the eyes of God. So both of them has that penalty. It's not because you're non-Jew, Hashem is cruel to you. No. It's to his own children that worship an idol. The same thing, death penalty. Just like someone who doesn't keep Shabbat, also death penalty. Homosexuality, death penalty. There's a list of death penalties in the Torah. A murderer, any murderer. Any murderer is death penalty. It's against the Ten Commandments. So there was Ger Toshav. You can stay here, you be a righteous Gentile, you don't fight the Jews, you do what you do in your home, it's your life. But in public, on Shabbat, you're not gonna break Shabbat on the street. You have to respect the law of the land. Tov. Many of them go in, agree, to stay. Not allowed to touch them, they have rights. There is a different kind of ger, which is called ger tzedek. When the Gentiles say, I don't want to stay a Gentile. I want to be a Jew. I want to convert to Judaism. After you test him for the 13 principles, and you know for sure that he accepted all of them with no hesitation, and you see for a while that he already kept the commandments, he knows how to keep Shabbat, if it's a woman that she's dressed fully modest, and uh, the language, what they speak about, their ideology, when they eat, they eat only kosher, they make brachot, they know how to make brachot, even in English, even in a different language. To be a Jew, you don't need to know Hebrew. Many goyim, when they, when they approach me, they want to convert, first thing, do I have to learn Hebrew? No. There's a lot of religious American Jews who don't speak Hebrew. They don't. Whatever they read, they have translation to English. Some Farsi, translation to Farsi. Russian, Russian Sidur. I don't know Hebrew. You can be a righteous person learning in a different language. Of course, it's always better to know Hebrew. Not the, the modern Hebrew of Israel. That's uh, completely crooked, the language. Talking the, the ancient Hebrew, the Lashon HaKodesh of Chazal, of, of the Torah. So, you know, what we read in the Sidur, this is the language of Chazal. Before the state of Israel, that was formed by many wicked communist Zionists, anti-God, enemies of God. Every one of them is a monster. Hated Hashem, hated the religion, hated Shabbat, hated the rabbis, hated the religious people, cannot stand Bachurei Yeshivot. They're allergic to everything smelled Jewish. Allergic. They turn Israel to a state of goyim, public school that teach terrible things, all kinds of communist authors from Russia and Poland. As long as you don't bring us your religion to here. They didn't want religion at all. When the Yemenite came, they realized that they're very naive. They're very down to earth. They came from Yemen, they stood by them and cut their peot right away. After three weeks, they forced them to work on Shabbat. So if you want food for your children, you must come to the kibbutz and work in the farm. In agriculture, plants, trees, oranges, tomatoes, cucumbers, you have to work, give water to the plants. They broke them. They don't have what to eat. They said to them, you, want, you need a red card, like in Russia, like Lenin. You need a red card in order for you to be a member of the union. It's called Istadrut. Communist, all communism. Kibbutzim, Moshavim, it's all made, made in Russia. And the Yemenites say, okay, I'm going to be a member of the union. What do I need to do? You have to come work on Shabbat. We'll tell you where to go. How can I be? I'm, I'm a religious Jew. Don't worry, the Mashiach came already. Don't you see you came to the Holy Land? They didn't want to work. One week, second week, third week, the children are starving. Water comes on their head. They put them in a ma'abarot. Nothing to eat. 
people told them it's pikuach nefesh, it's a life risk, you have to feed your children. Even the Torah says, when your life is in a risk, you have to break Shabbat. So they made the grandparents mechalalei Shabbat, their children were already complete chilonim, and the grandchildren today, not just chilonim, big haters of Hashem. It's a difference to be a regular chiloni, secular Jew, who respect the religion, just doesn't want to keep, or someone that is allergic to it, cannot stand Torah, cannot hear a word of Torah. That's what they turned them. 80% of the people in Israel are almost like that. Almost 80%. Almost 80%. You have two million religious people in Israel. And almost all the Chilonim today are big haters of Torah. Baruch Hashem, after October 7, you begin to hear many of them regret the things they used to say. I regret how I spoke against the rabbis and the religion and the Torah and against Judaism. They're opening up their eyes. They realize without Torah we have no existence. But until October 7, if you hear some of the things you would hear on the Israeli television and in the newspaper, you won't be sure if you live in Israel or in Nazi Germany. You won't believe it. If I'll show you parts from the newspaper and I ask you, tell me who said it, you would all answer Hitler, Reichmann, Hess. Has to be them. And no, no, it was a published in the Israeli newspaper. These lefty liberal newspapers. A year ago, six months ago, it was in a public television, on the news. On the news, here, it would happen here in America, you know what a lawsuit you would have against the channel? If they would say things like this in CNN? You saw what happened in Harvard University. You know how many students are suing them now? They're gonna make millions now, each student? Why? Racism against Judaism. In Israel it's allowed, in Harvard it's not allowed, in Yale it's not allowed. It's racism, it's a lawsuit, it's a hate crime. But in Israel it's legal. Why? Ministers in the government say it. People from the police speak like this. Judges in the court speak like this. What do you expect? The whole country is like this. The most anti-Semite country in the world is Israel. No place in the world you hate Jews more than they hate in Israel. Which Jews? Religious Jews. Religious Jews they hate. Secular Jews? No problem. No problem. But now things are starting to change now. On my last visit to Israel, I saw. I saw a lot of broken chilonim. They are destroyed. They realize there's no more future to them. Their secular Khamenei state reached the end of it. That's it. The army cannot save. The government is totally corrupted. Nobody can save them. Not the police. Not nothing. They realize, if we don't now turn to Hashem, we will all be dead in a year or two. We can't, we can't fight these monster Nazis. We can't. They're just not ending. You just killed today 500. Boom, another 50,000 waiting online. You killed another 1,000, another 200,000 waiting to show. <laughs> it can end. You killed 100 terrorists today. 5,000 were born. 5,000 were born. You killed another 1,000. 20,000 were born. What are you going to do? We're lucky that the Torah told us that when Mashiach comes, it will be the end. If not that, we would have to give up already and find an alternative state. What keeps us going is just that Hashem promised us it will be very tough we're going to have this fifth exile, the Galut Ishmael, until the Mashiach would come. Once the Mashiach would come, their end would come. And until then, they're going to teach us a lesson. They're coming to kill us and scream the name of Hashem. Screaming the name of Hashem when they're murdering us. One of my students, is Baal Tshuva from Atlanta, American Ashkenazi, nice guy, very smart. He's already in Israel, I don't know, 20 years he lives there almost, 15, 20 years. He told me he wants to give now a lecture about the situation with the Arabs and this. So he started to ask me about what they say in Islam and this. I told him it's not relevant what the Islam say. 
The Islam is not what makes their decisions. Before Islam, they already wanted to kill all Jews. It's nothing new. Islam is only 1,300 years old. Ishmael wanted to kill us already 3,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago already the Zohar speaks about their cruelty. That was 700 years before the Quran. When they keep saying, we don't hate Jews, we hate the Zionists. What do you mean? In Hebron, 20 years before the Israeli state, you already butchered Jews in Hebron. You killed more than 80 of them in one day. Slaughter them. It's like you slaughter sheep. There was no Zionist state. There was no state of Israel. You kill them because they are Jews. You kill Jews in Iraq. You kill Jews in every other Arab countries. What does it have to do with the Israeli state? We're talking 100 or 200 years before the Israel became a state. It's all fake. Same thing in Iran. We don't hate Jews, we hate the Zionists. You hate the Zionists? Why you kill religious Jews? If you hate the Zionists, communists, okay. Why do you come? Almost everyone you kill is a religious Jew who live according to the Torah. So I asked him, I told him, don't look for any justice or logic. It's, they first decide what they want to do, and it's to kill Jews. And now they begin to twist everything around. Prophet Muhammad meant this, and he meant that. And if he would say in the Quran, you're not allowed to touch one Jew and ever, ever make him drip one, blood, one drop of blood. They will find a way to justify it. Just like religious Jews justify their sins, don't you have gays with yamaka on the head? In a gay parade? With yamaka, rainbow, yamaka. Me and my husband came to dance with the Torah. I asked him, but how, do you, how can you live in such a conflict? Well, we'll justify it. The thieves don't retail him before they come to rob you? Don't they pray to God to help them to rob the store or to rob the bank? <laughs> they, when they pray, they don't pray that the police doesn't, does not catch them when they come to steal. How do you justify stealing from people? First I decide my, what my evilness wants to dictate for me. And then I twist all the truth to match what I want to do. Jews do it, Arabs do it, Allah wars. Every wicked person does it. By the wicked people is first what's good for me, then what's good for God. If what's good for me match what God likes, fantastic, I'm happy. I don't want deliberately to declare a war against him. But if what I like, it's against what he likes, he will have to understand me one way or the other. He's not going to dictate to me what's right and what's wrong. First, I follow my instinct and my logic and my uh, desire. And if it works for him, fine. If not, he will have to live with that. Like Santa Claus say in his book, I didn't ask to come to the world. You have no right to tell me what to do. You have to apologize to me for putting me here. I don't have to apologize to you for doing what I want to do. That's what this whole book is about. And he's still invited to events around here, to shuls that consider themselves orthodox, but the, the reality is that they are worse than a church. Someone that is smart and knows the Jewish principle, hopefully after this series he will know very well. A place that invites Santa Claus, you're not allowed to step there ever again. Cannot pray there anymore. It's much like a church. Because in a church, they don't declare a war against Hashem. They're just a bunch of idol worshippers. They were educated that God has a son. That's how they taught from, from age zero. Not deliberately decided to modify the truth and declare a war against God. No. They just believe a fake God, the Son of God, that's it. Which is all false. But those people who after they got warning from many people, sending them an email, all the horrible things that his filthy mouth says in his speeches, and they still did not cancel the event. Just like the other one, heretic in uh, Boca Raton, that wants to invite the Christian heretics 
uh, admire of Hitler and, and, uh, and a big fan of JC, a Christian missionary to speak to his community and people begged him to cancel the event, rabbis wrote him letters, people even threatened him. We went with the head into the wall and paying him thirty, forty thousand dollars for that lousy speech. That he should have access to the Jewish people in the shul to convert them to his idol. No matter what, you show them the truth, you warn them. It's like talking to the wall. That's how they are, these idol worshippers. Mesitim la'avodazara. You cannot step to a place like this. Sometimes it's innocent mistake. Innocent mistake. Someone doesn't know anything from his life, so that he's popular, invited him. The question is, after he got the evidence of what he said with videos, with proofs, and still went with the event, a place like this is not kosher anymore. Okay, it's not kosher. Absolutely not kosher. If someone declares that he hates God and he wants to burn the Torah, you invite him to speak in a shul? If a rabbi of a shul invites someone that stands in his YouTube speeches and says, I hate God and I want to burn the Torah, like they did in Sweden, they wanted to burn the Torah. That person who declared that he's going to burn the Torah, if you invite him now to a shul in Great Neck, someone like that, can you step into that shul after that? If the rabbi of the shul invited the one who wanted to burn the Torah to be a guest of honor and to give a speech to the community, after you see something like this, can you go and pray in that such a place? If you're stupid, go. I don't have to tell you where your prayers will go. Definitely not to Hashem. Definitely not to Hashem. You have to be very careful where you go. If you go to a shul that doesn't have heresy, just doesn't have a kosher mechitza. You see over here? You have a kosher mechitza. You close the curtain. No man can see women in the times of prayers. Kosher shul. Men separate, women separate. Here they don't bring heretics to speak. People come here, they walk. Shabbat, they shomer Shabbat. Kosher place. If the place wouldn't have kosher mechitza, you're not allowed to give speeches there. It's not a kosher place. You can't, you can't give a speech there. Why? Would you give a speech in a church? Would you give a speech in a reform shul? Can you step into a reform shul? Not allowed to step. You want to go and do an event. You, want, you know, I forget about it. You're an electrician. You want to get a job in a church. $100,000 contract to fix all the lighting and all that. You're not allowed to step there to give a to give a, an offer. A mask, you're allowed to go in. Or reform shul, you're not allowed to walk in. Mask, you're allowed to walk in. It's not a place of idol worshipping. Church and reform shul, you cannot go in, you cannot walk in. Yesterday I had a question like this. A girl has a business. She asked me if she can go into a church to give an offer for a job. Not, absolutely not. What about if she sends a goy? Goy. He can go there and give them a job offer. If the goyim will do the job, the goyim will do the job. But the Jew is not allowed to do. He's not allowed to service a church in any way. The light doesn't work. You're not allowed to fix it. Why are you contributing to their idol? You're helping their cause. You have a place they want to rent it from you. You're not allowed to rent it to them. You're not allowed to rent it for them. If someone wants to make a kosher shul, you're allowed to rent it. They want to make a reform shul, you're not allowed to give them the property. Even if they're offering you ten times more. There are a lot of laws. If people won't learn Torah, how will they know what's allowed, what's not allowed? The problem is that some of these mistakes are crucial. That mamash makes the Jews lose his olam haba. No joke. Giving Santa a stage to speak to people, donating to his event, promoting it, giving the place, make you literally lose your olam haba. Guarantee. Mamash is like putting an idol inside Bet HaMikdash. Some tselem ba'echal. 
It's terrible. People make fun. In Israel, they have an answer for those people. Remember the famous Israeli sentence? Tzohek, mi she tzohek acharon. Doesn't matter who laughs in the meantime. It matters who would be laughing in the end. Those who laugh in the end would laugh for good. Those who laugh for now, today they laugh, tomorrow they cry. Question, in the end of the battle, who is going is gonna to laugh? No one will remember 10 rounds of boxing match. People only remember who lifted his hands up and won in the end. And took 30 million dollars. <laughs> That's it. Anyone will remember five years later who was better in the fight? The one who lost gave more punches. But in the end, the other one gave him one punch to his head and knocked him down. That's all people remember. Right now, they laugh. They make fun. Yeah, you're fanatic. You're extreme. We disagree. You're entitled to your opinion. They, have, uh, they make fun. No problem. Hashem already said, Ineni nishpat otach al omrech lo chatati. You should know, there are two kinds of punishments. One punishment is for the actual sin. And the bigger punishment is for the nerve to say, I did not do anything wrong. I did nothing wrong. For that sentence, I did nothing wrong, you get a bigger punishment than the actual sin. You lit a cigarette on Shabbat. That penalty. Cut for the soul. Someone said, this shame on you, you mechalel Shabbat. Ah, don't tell me what to do, you don't know anything from your life. In the old days, it was hard to create father, you needed two rocks. It was a hard job. Today, you have a lighter. Tack, the fire comes out. It's not a breaking Shabbat. Oh, a new Rambam came to the world. These fools don't know that in the old days there was no electric. Every house needed light. So what did they do? In the walls of every house, they had little holes, a barrel of oil, and candles all over to give light to the, to the house. They never had to create new fire. They have hundreds of, of lights. All they need when the barrel is about to end, put a new barrel, take from the existing fire, and light the new barrel, that's it. What do you think? They would take two rocks and wait two hours until they're gonna have a spark of fire? You really think that people that stupid, every time they need fire, they're gonna create fire by, by, by uh, rubbing uh, rocks together? Once you have a fire, like in Yom Tov, we, we light from one candle to another. That's how they used to do it. Hundreds of lights. You need light. Remember, there's no, there's no, there's no light bulbs. How do you have light in the house? You need to read. You need to learn. You need to pray. Dead candles. Lots of fire all over around. That's what gave at night, at 9 p.m. What do you do? You're sitting in a cabin or in a tent. You need to have light. You always had fire. Plus, to warm you up, you had fire pieces of wood in the winter. So we move on. So the other kinds of gear is gear tzedek. After we check them 100% that they believe 100% in all 13 principles, all, not 12, not 11, all 13, now we check. They know how to keep Shabbat, they know halachot. We don't expect the converts to be rabbis. We don't ask them all the laws of muktze and all kinds of complicated questions. No. Those questions most Jews also don't know. They don't learn seriously in yeshiva. They don't know. But we want them to know the major halachot. Woman needs to know how to dress modest at all time. Not to mess up here and there. No. And she has to know what's kosher, what's not kosher. Otherwise she feed her family with non-kosher food. She has to know. She has to know the holidays. She has to know how to cook before Shabbat, after. All these things she needs to know. He needs to know halachot. He needs to know how to put filin. You want to be a Jew? Did you put filin? No. You don't know how to put? How tomorrow morning you're going to wake up as a Jew? 
We convert you today. Tomorrow morning you have to put fill in. You don't even have to fill in. You need to know. Once we see they know and they're serious and they live close to a shul, orthodox only. If it's not orthodox, it's not a shul. It's a place of abomination. If it's a kosher orthodox shul, we ask them to move there, to live next to there, to start practicing. Once the bedding is convinced that they are serious, you convert them to Judaism. From the minute you convert them, there's no return. They can change their mind a month later. Oh, I didn't know it's going to be so tough. I thought Shabbat it's easy. Now when I'm a Jew, it's very tough. I, didn't, I used to pray very, very short. Now I come to shul, it's an hour every morning. It's too much for me. I want to go back to be a Gentile, a Norkaid, a righteous Gentile. It was good, it was easy. There's no return. You went into the water, a Gentile, you came out a Jew. A, a Jewish soul merged into your non-Jewish soul. That's what makes you from this moment on a new person, a brand new person, like a baby that was right now was born. You are one hour old. It's the first hour of your life, whether you're 30, 40, 50, or 90. How old are you? You're not 90. You're one hour old. After a week, how old are you? One week old. What happened until now doesn't exist anymore. That's it. It's, you don't even see it in the file in history. You are a new person. The guy that you used to be, it's dead. It's the gun. You have no relation to your relative. Your biological parents are not your parents. Your biological children are not your children. Your biological brothers and sisters are not considered your brothers and sisters. If your sister now will convert also, you're allowed to marry her. The Torah, the Chachamim, does not allow it. But let's say Chris and Christina, two brothers, they both come to convert. They went into the mikveh, same day. Chris, a minute later, his sister, Christine. Now they can get married. If they want it, they can get married. What do you mean? It's from the same seed, from the same father. Doesn't matter, it's two new, brand new people. Strangers. Of course, they're going to stay friends after all. They grew up together and they have mutual parents. All of that stay the same. They respect their Gentile parents. They, should, they can never be ungrateful. Remember this. Great ungratefulness Hashem cannot stand. But the Chachamim, Chazal, forbid that. Forbid that. Do you know if a Jewish man married a non-Jewish woman. There's no such marriage, according to the Torah. But he went to some reform clown, and he made a ceremony. Yosef and Christina, and now they had a baby, a girl. 20 years later, this Yosef is now, when he married Christina, he was 21. She was 20. A year later, they had a baby. Let's call her Jennifer. Jennifer, 20 years later, realized she's not Jewish. Her father is Jewish, maybe her last name is Cohen, but she's not Jewish. So she comes to the rabbi, I want to convert. You're going to keep Shabbat, of course. Keep modesty, of course. Eat kosher, of course. I read Tehillim, I daven. I don't feel any connection to my non-Jewish family from my mother's side. I'm 100% Bukharian, or Persian, or whatever. That's it, I'm, I'm, I feel Jewish. Okay, no problem. They convert her. Now she's 20 years old. How old is her father? Yosef is 41, right? He had her when he was 21. According to Hashem in the Torah, he can marry her that day. His own daughter. She's not his daughter. When you have a child from a non-Jewish woman, is 100% a non-Jew. There's no half-Jew, like some people in America. I'm half-Jewish. There's no such thing. Either when you were born, Hashem gave you a Jewish soul or a non-Jewish soul. If He gave you a Jewish soul, you're 100% Jewish. If He gave you a non-Jewish soul, you're 100% not Jewish. Be righteous Gentile, but you're not Jewish. And it's not relevant what you feel. It's not relevant what you feel. 
He can be 100% Jew and he feels like he's some guy from Texas. Try to imitate them, be a cowboy in the Rodeo. He feels a guy from Texas playing a rock and roll bed, he's full of tattoos. Speak like a guy, behave like a guy. He's 100% Jewish, it doesn't change the fact. He can be a guy that lives 100% like a Jew, religious. Come to shul, put filin, keep Shabbat, everything. It doesn't matter, he's not Jewish. The Chachamim, because they didn't want the world to have a, a big shock, how can it be that someone marries his own daughter or his own sister after she converted to Judaism, how can it be? The Chachamim made a decree that it's not allowed. But we don't care right now about that. We care what Hashem said. This is the answer to all those Jews who have children with non-Jewish women. Thinking, ah, it's my child, it has to be Jewish. No, no, no. If the wife is not Jewish, the kids are not Jewish. So, Rabotai, if they convert, Baruch Hashem, they consider Gerei Tzedek. If one day they stop keeping mitzvot, they are now Jewish secular people and they are being punished for every commandment they don't keep just like a Jew from birth. No discount. Oh, I didn't know Shabbat's going to be so hard. So I'm not keeping fully. Every time Chris, former Chris or Christine that now is Jewish after the conversion, Every time they will break Shabbat, they get the same punishment like someone that was born Jewish. Same punishment, no discount. That's why they ask them ten times before they go into the water. You sure? Do you know if you break Shabbat, it's a death penalty. That's what they say in the bed din. Moment before they immerse in the water. There's no return. Once you go in, that's it. It's not up to us anymore. We cannot cancel it. And you have to see how they cry. Almost all of them cry, male, female. It's a very emotional moment. But sometimes, if you're not careful enough and you choose people that are not worthy, six months later you see them, what happened? Ah, it's too much for me. I, I, can't, I, can't, I can't live like that. It's too much for me. I'm used to my freedom. We ask you ten times before. Nobody forced you to be Jewish, the opposite. We told you don't, stay righteous Gentiles. We're not missionaries, we're not hunting people. We tell every goy, stay a goy. Just be a righteous goy, that's it. You have heaven when you die. After we beg them not to be Jewish, they did everything they can to be Jewish. And then, a few months later, they want to be a goyim again. There's no return. So far, you got the point? Let's move on. The Rambam continues. Everyone from every nation that wants to convert, we will tell him, if he's serious, welcome. We will teach him what to do and, and accept him. If it's a male, we will circumcise him. If he was already circumcised in a hospital, we will take one tiny drop of blood, like they take, you know, in a sugar test. Tuck, one little thing, a little blood came, no pain, no nothing, and it's over. If it's a female, just go in and out of the water after they pass the test, of course. Someone who does not want to, con to convert, you don't force him to accept Torah and mitzvot. He's, not, he's an Jew. The Torah belongs to the Jewish people. And this is what Moshe commanded us in the name of Hashem to obligate the Gentiles to keep the seven laws of Noah only. Not Shabbat. The opposite. You're not allowed to keep Shabbat. I want to eat kosher food. You want to eat kosher food? Eat. You want to eat non-kosher food? Eat. You're allowed. I want to make tattoo. Make tattoo, you go, you're allowed. If you consider to become Jewish one day, you better don't make it. Why? You're going to have an embarrassment. 
you have children, they'll be religious, they'll see you take off your shirt, you go to the pool. Dad, why you have this woman on your arm? Who is she? Oh, it's my girlfriend when I was your age. Imagine if he's on the left arm, he has to put filin of Hashem. He lifts his arm, he see a not modest girl on his arm. It happens to some people. In general, my personal opinion, regardless of religion, that making tattoos is one of the dumbest things in life. That's my opinion. It's forbidden, it's against the Torah. But even if it was not forbidden, I think personally that this is very, very stupid. Almost as stupid as trying drugs to feel how it feels. It's just as stupid, almost. Because sometimes there's no return. You're willing to destroy your life. If you try it and, and physically you will like it or whatever, you're going to run after it. You're going to run after it, your life will be over. Same thing with the tattoos. I had once a guy, you know, sending emails nonstop. I'm begging you, help me to convert. I keep already everything. I say, okay, you know what? Let's meet in person. I speak in uh, Kew Garden over there, in Lefferts Boulevard, in a big shul. Come meet me over there. The guy came. I almost became blind. There's not one inch of his body that is not covered with tattoo. Fingers, arms, palms, face, neck, everywhere. Everywhere in the face. Who makes tattoos in the face? I asked him, wow, I see you didn't waste any time. We have hundreds of tattoos here. It's also very expensive. I asked him, I don't want to ask you what's under the shirt. If you don't mind, take a picture and send it to me with the email. What am I going to tell him? Take off your shirt now? I'm thinking, I see all these tattoos all over his face and his arms and everywhere and his hands. But I don't know what's, be, what's on, the, on the back. I don't know. He sends me a picture. I see a big cross on his back with JC like this. Now imagine someone like this will convert to Judaism, he comes to the mikveh, the rabbis will get a heart attack. Three rabbis will fall into the water with him. Instead of one in the mikveh, there will be four. I told the guy, my heart is breaking for you, but my advice to you, you shouldn't convert. He said, why? So I look at you, I mean, you're going to have Jewish kids. You're going to have to go pick them up from yeshiva. All the religious kids, they don't know, kids don't know. They see with all this, they're going to insult your kids. What, your father is a guy, he's not Jewish, what is this? You're not, a, you're not a Jew, why you came here to yeshiva? You know how kids are. They don't have uh, tact. Every second of your life, you go, you're going to go to the mikveh before Shabbat. Everyone will get the shock of their life. It's not one or two tattoos. And there's no way to remove it. The tattoos was the reason this guy didn't convert. Can you believe it? He was perfect for conversion. Very serious, very devoted. I just told him it's going to destroy your life. You're going to go on a date. You have a Jewish girl. Let's say Baalat Tshuva. She likes you. You're a nice guy. You're nice looking. She see all of this. She's not going to agree to marry you. What are you going to do? I'm gonna, I will decree on you to stay single for the rest of your life. And if you will marry an ex Goya that is also full of tattoos, let's say, what kind of social life you're going to have with your kids, with the yeshivot, with the community in a synagogue? People cannot understand what does it mean a Baal Tshuva. What he used to be and what he is now. People will always, if you give them a hint, what he used to be or what she used to be, that's all they're going to focus on. You know what it's like? You know how sometimes you come to a big hall and on the ceiling they have squares, stereophone, you know this material? It's, it's, you have hundreds of them, but one is missing. Everyone who comes to this room, what does he stare at? The missing square. The entire ceiling is full. 
One of them is missing. Everyone looks at the missing one, or the one that had a leak. Nobody looks at the perfect ceiling anywhere else. That's the nature of people. <laughs> the Rambam continue. If people live in Israel, you force them to keep the seven laws of Noah. If they refuse, they cannot stay in Israel. Needless to say, if they want to worship their idols as they used to, you do not permit it no matter what. Anyone who will not accept it and insist to stay in Israel doesn't want to leave. We don't have to run to China and uh, force the Chinese to stop worshipping their idols, or in India, or in anywhere else in the world, because the Torah says, hara mi kirbecha. You clean the bed from among you, your community. I don't have to fix the whole world. I don't have to go to the Arab countries and speak. It's against God to murder people. Stop with your terrorism and supporting terrorists. Stop with this. Stop killing Jews, stop killing Christians, and stop killing your own people. Stop with this. It's against the religion of the Gentiles. It's not my obligation. Today we can do it through YouTube. They listen anyway. They share. It. But I don't have an obligation to go to Syria and tell them, why you kill each other? It's against the Torah, it's against God. You're not supposed to murder each other. The same thing, I don't have to do it in Iraq, or in Afghanistan, or in any other country. I don't have to go to all the idol worshiping, worshiping places, give them speeches about their idols. But if they live in the Holy Land, as my obligation, the people in charge in Israel, the king, or in the government, must clean the idol worshiping and the abomination from the Holy Land. So, the Rambam continue. Everyone who accepts on himself to keep the seven laws of Noah and carefully observe them, Hareze, he is or she, Hasidei Umot Haolam, the righteous Gentile of the nations of the world. A very high level people. Very high level, whether they are European, whether they are Arabs, whether they are Oriental, it's no difference. They keep the seven laws, doesn't matter, they're white, black, Asian, whatever they are, it's no difference whatsoever. The body, look, color, or anything like that, does not add or decree from their spiritual level whatsoever. Same thing among Jews. You're dark, you're light, you're blonde, color of your eyes, none of that make you righteous or wicked. Only actions. And he has a share to the world to come. These Gentiles have, when they die, heaven of Gentiles. It's much better than the hell the wicked Jews will get. Much better. He fulfilled his mission in life, his goal. When the Messiah would come, they will remain. They won't die. Wicked Jews and wicked Gentiles will be clean from the face of the earth. There's hundreds of verses and sources for it. Among the prophets and the Zohar, the Holy Zohar, the Kabbalah. That's not the topic now. But they will remain. They will see the Jews building the third temple. There will be no antisemitism, no war, no armies, no weapon. All nations would live in peace. That's it. Everyone will know there's only one real religion. The religion of God is Judaism only. Everything that came later was all fake. Now everyone knows it. The righteous Gentiles who survive and the righteous Jews, everybody knows it. No disagreement about that. So it's not, a, it's not open for debate. But the Rambam makes a comment, and it's very important to know. 
This is only on a condition that the Gentiles keep the seven law because it's the command of God and not because it's logical to human logic. Why are you not a murderer? It's not, it's not ethical to murder. You believe in God? No. You believe in the soul? No. You believe in the afterlife? No. So why don't kill? It says you should not kill. I can care less what it says. I don't believe in the Torah. I don't believe in God. I don't believe in the Ten Commandments. I'm an atheist. So why you don't steal? Because it's not ethical. It has zero reward. Why you don't murder? Because it's not ethical. Why you don't bow down to this Buddha like the rest of your going friends? Because it's stupid. Why it's stupid? Someone just made it in a factory yesterday. This is going to be my God? I don't believe in any God. Needless to say, a piece of metal. It doesn't get a reward. Zero reward. It's not a righteous Gentile. Because that's common sense. You did, do, you did nothing divine here. But if you do it because God said so, same thing Jews. Why don't you steal? Because it's not ethical. Society cannot tolerate thieves. That's not, an act, that's not a noble act here. It's not a divine righteousness. It's only righteousness when you do it because Hashem said so. Do you get the point or no? Let me read to you the words of the Rambam. Ve'u sheyekabel otam ve'yase otam mipnei sheziva bahem hakadosh baruch hu batorah. This is only that he keeps them and accept them because Hashem commanded those seven laws in his Torah and informed the world with his messenger Moses that the children of Noah, meaning all the Gentiles of the entire world, they are commanded to keep them by Hashem. But if he does it because it's required by common sense, and the Ger Toshav, he is not, he does not have the privilege to remain, to live in the Holy Land as a Ger Toshav, as a resident of, the, of, of Israel. No, because he's not a righteous Gentile. You send him back to a different place. Find yourself a place. You cannot stay in the land of God. Ve'eno mi'chasidei umot ha'olam. He's not considered a righteous Gentile. This comment, most people don't know. I mean, most people heard about the seven laws of Noah. But not everyone knows that if you keep them because anyway it's normal not to do it. You know, anyway, why don't you eat an animal unless they're dead first? Because I feel cruel if I eat a, le a, le a, le a leopard or a lizard when it's still moving in a plate or a mice or mouse, like the Chinese do. Ugh, it's disgusting. How can you eat something that moves in a plate? How do you eat cockroaches? How do you eat worms? How? It's not normal. Ah. So you don't eat it, not because God said so to the Gentiles that are not allowed to do it. You do not do it because it's disgusting. There's no, it's no righteousness here. For instance, if a Chinese person will come and say, I used to eat animals that are moving a plate. I heard a lecture and I realized that I'm a Gentile. If I want to be righteous, I have to keep the seven laws. Although I love that very much to eat all kinds of insects, I stop to eat. Why? Not because it's not logical. In my culture, people eat it all the time. Millions eat it every day. Everywhere, in restaurants, in places, in weddings, Chinese people eat. But I don't eat anymore. Why? God said so. Say so Gentiles are allowed to eat any animal they want as long as it's dead first. Not to eat it while they're still alive. That's it. Oh, so that's because of God. Yes, because of God. Oh, now you have one credit out of the seven. 
I hope you understand the concept. So there are three general rules that we learn here. One, an oblig it's an obligation to every Jew to force all the Gentiles to keep the seven laws of Noah. Where? When they live among us, here in, in Israel, in the land of Israel. Two, a resident of Israel and a ger tzedek, a convert, are two different things. If a Gentile wants to stay in Israel and promise to keep the seven laws, does he have to come and declare it in a Jewish court, like the converts do? Converts have to come and declare that they accept all the commandments of the Torah in order for them to become Jewish. But if a, if a Gentile just wants to remain to live in Israel, here, I got rid of my idols. I burned them. From now on, I keep only the seven laws that you taught me. Come to the bedding and swear. No, you don't need to. Bedding is not for them in this particular matter. It's enough that he declared that he's going to keep it, and we follow what he does. If we find he's a liar, we'll kick him out. As long as he, we see that he keeps them, that's it. We let him stay there. And the third law here, all Gentiles must keep the seven laws because God said so, and no for logical reasons. The Rambam, in Alacha 9, this was Alacha, this was the end of chapter 8. The next Alacha is Alacha 9, actually the one before. In Alacha Yud, this is what we just said. In the previous Alacha, the Rambam explained the laws in the Torah of a pretty Goya. Eshet Yefat Torah. The Torah says if you come to a war, you see a beautiful non-Jewish woman, you're far away from your home, from your country, and you like her. And they're not allowed to marry her unless she's converting first. But until you bring her to Israel and until she converts, it may take months. Now the Torah surrenders supposedly to your evil inclination. Gives you permission one time to be with her, to relax your desire. Then you bring her with you to the land. She shaves her head, she makes her hair long, she dresses like a prisoner, she cries for her family that she will never see. Basically, she does everything she can to look ugly in your eyes. And if there, after a month, after you see her with, our, with no hair, with long nails, by the way, <laughs> from here, I hope there are some smart women out there that listens to this and get the point. From here you learn that according to God's opinion, not the fools in Facebook and Twitter, forget about these guys, according to your maker, to your creator, who supplies you with oxygen and health, who watch you non-stop 24-7, who gives you everything you have or may not give you what you don't have, it's up to him. According to him, it's disgusting for a woman to shave her head, to have bald hair, like men has. For men, it's nice. Manly, it's very much in style now to be bald. People with hair shave their head now. It's in, 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 in. When I was a teenager, it was very much against the style. People went crazy to try to prevent them get, being bald. Today, even people that have hair don't care, they shave it. Why? It became in style, that's almost every Israeli is bald, you see. Even those who have hair. It's a matter of style. But regardless of this, for women it's against the law. If a woman shave her head, it's against the Torah. She can, she's not allowed to do anything that looks like a man. And one other thing, if she makes her nail long like a witch, that's disgusting in the eyes of Hashem. Where does it say it? 
Hashem doesn't want this Jew to have intimacy with a non-Jewish woman. It's against his will. But you don't, you don't let go. Your desire, oh, I have to, I have to, I cannot fight. Oh, you have to. Let's take some steps to cool your desire. One, shave her head. Immediately you don't want to be with her. If you still want to be with a woman that looks like a man, no, Hashem Ya'azor. Wait until she has long witchy nails. That should be enough disgusting for you not to be, not want to be with her. Today it's the other way around. The longer it is, the more attractive it is for, for some fools out there. Not only that, they have all these rainbow stars. They pay hundreds of dollars to sit by the Chinese, Korean. How long would you like it? All the way from here to the door. But how are you going to be able to function? You know how sometimes you come to the office, longer, like, the nail is longer than the finger. If a man is attracted to it, it's a mental disease. Please go and check why. Something is not right with you. Why? It's not divine. It's filled. Any religious girl in yeshiva, you're going to see her with nails like this? God forbid. In a good yeshivot for girls, a girl like this will never be accepted. That's enough. Just nails like this. It's, you don't belong here. You don't belong here. Don't say, I say it. Forget about it. My opinion doesn't count. I'm just telling you what Hashem said. You know this halacha, right? It's not, nothing new to you. Hashem said, I want her to cry a lot. From here you learn that a woman that cried too much, she doesn't look as good as she's supposed to. It makes her look not as good. She cries a lot. And if she makes long hair, it makes her ugly. And if she shaves her hair, it makes her uglier. Maybe not ugly, but uglier than what she was before she shaved her head. That's written in the Torah of God, not in the Torah of any human being. So the Rambam now explains. The Rambam says, in al how do you behave with your fat Torah? You have this uh, Gentile woman, or a city of Gentiles that refuse to accept the laws of Bnei Noach. They refuse. They want to remain idol worshippers. So I explained already. First priority, just leave. Go do whatever you want, but not here. No! You're not going to tell us what to do. We'll stay here and we worship our idols. Not alive. Cannot be. Why? God didn't give us an option. So they come to a war with you. In a war, you leave them one place to one, but you fight, and if they die, they die. The Rambam say, in the next chapters, how the Jews have to behave with the Gentiles in a time of a war. What happens if you have this Goya? You want to take her. You want to marry her. But she doesn't want to leave her idol. She brings little Buddha with her. You want to take me to Tel Aviv? You take my God with me. No, no, you're not allowed to throw it away. It's an idol. I didn't tell you to take me. I'm a prisoner here in a war. You like me, right? You want to take me to your country? You want me to marry you? I have to, you told me I have to shave my hair, I have to make long nails, I have to cry for my parents. I, I got that point. But I'm not letting JC live my life. I'm devoted to JC Penny. Or to little booty. I'm not letting go. What do you do? You're allowed to take it or not? Not allowed. 
What about the desire? We have a big conflict here. Why the Torah compromised on a wicked person with a weak character, desire, because the, the, the Gemara say, because Hashem knew that in a time of war, with sadness and loneliness and agony, and if he fall in love with some Goya who smiles to him, save me from this hell, meaning she's a prisoner of war now, and she gives him all these smiles, he would lose his mind. So for only one time, I allow you this horrible sin. Right? Why? Because you would do it anyway, with or without me. I know the psychology of a man. But what happened if she's holding to her idol? We already have an example of Jews who went to the Goyot, who forced them to bow down to their idols. Who? Bnot Moav. How many Jews died because of that? 24,000 Jews died for bowing down to their idol. It went like this. And Hashem wiped them out. 24,000 in one shot. If you bow down to a rabbi, it's the same bed. Rabbi, idol, doesn't matter. Anyone that is not God, you bow down to it, or to him, or to her, or it doesn't matter, or to a picture. That's 100% Avu Dazara. It doesn't matter how righteous he is. Even if it was Moshe Rabbeinu, why Hashem did not tell us where Moshe is buried? The whole world would worship him. If people worship rabbis who live in our generation, that they are not one billionth of the level of Moshe Rabbeinu, not one billionth, anyone, doesn't reach one billionth of the level of Moshe who spoke to Hashem and gave us the Torah, and the Torah is named after him. If people worship holy rabbis who lived in our days, and they became their God, do you know what would happen to the world? if they knew the grave of Moshe. Do you know what would be over there? People will kill each other and align there to touch the grave. Hashem made sure no one will know where the grave of Moshe is. No one knows. These three general rules that we just mentioned is coming from the Torah who was given to the Jewish nation. It wasn't given to the Goim. It was given to the Jewish people. So, from here we learn that it's the obligation of the Jewish people to teach all the Gentiles in the world about their obligation to God. We must teach them not to be idol worshippers. We must, much, must teach them not to be thieves, not to be murderers, to believe in one God, not to eat animals unless they dead first, to establish a justice system in every place where they live with police and courts. They make the laws of the land. Not to be idol worshippers, as we said. Of course, no sex crimes with the relatives, or homosexuality, or any intimacy with animals, which is also death penalty for them. Once the Jew, it doesn't take more than half an hour for a Jew to teach a Gentile the seven laws of Noah. Today, when people ask me, I say, just Google it. Google it, you'll find everything. Right? Wasting time. Let him Google the seven laws of Noah. Immediately he gets with explanation in any language. You know how Google recognizes what country you're asking. So if you're in Israel, they will answer you in Hebrew. If you're in Thailand, they'll answer you in Thai. No matter what country you are, the Google change according to where you are. So fantastic. You ask in your language, you get an answer in your language. Today it's very easy. The Jews don't have to do it anymore. They only have to tell the Gentile that there is such a concept, like we just did. You want to find out about it? Google it. Rabbi Google will teach you. Rabbi Google.
But in the old days, when there was no Rabbi Google, Jews had to tell the Gentiles every place where the Jews live to tell the Goim over there what's their obligation from the Torah. The Gemara say one of the reasons why Hashem scattered the Jews in all the nations is to multiply the number of converts to teach the Goim about the Torah. And many of them would like to convert to Judaism. Who? How come one brother wants to convert, Tony, and his brother Vini doesn't? One decides to convert to Judaism, and the other one decided to stay righteous Gentile. Both of them heard the same rabbi, the same lectures. They watched the same Torah and science film. How come one wants to convert and the other one says, just let me stay righteous Gentiles and I'm a Gentile and I'm happy. What's behind that decision? The Holy Zohar says, Kabbalah, that every Gentile who wanted to convert to Judaism when the Jews got the Torah, Hashem asked all the goyim in all over the world, would you like to accept my Torah? And they made a vote. And they voted against it. The majority did not want to get the Torah. What about the minority? They wanted, but they couldn't. They were forced not to accept it. Every one of them is not deprived, is not neglected. Hashem reincarnated his soul in future generations in a right place, in a right time, where Jews can show them what does it mean to be Jewish. Or in today's technology that they will go into the right website and see what Judaism is about and what does it mean Torah. And they have now the right to convert what they wanted to do in a time when we got the Torah and they couldn't, now they have a special help from Hashem to convert. That's why Tony wants and Vini doesn't. Vini, in a time when the Jews got the Torah, was one that voted not to accept it. He has no merit, no siyata dishmaya to be a Jew. If he's lucky, he's going to be a righteous Gentile. But his brother, is a soul of a goy that wanted to convert. That's why sometimes you don't find logic here. No logic. All of a sudden a goy, white, black, oriental, doesn't really matter. I don't know where. I feel like I'm a Jew. Man, what do you mean you feel like I'm a Jew? I'm, I, I don't know. From a young age, I went to, uh, to school, I went to the library, I'm looking for everything Jewish. There is in college a course about Judaism. That's the first thing I join. Where does it come from? I get emails like this from all over the world every week. Goim that feels like they are attracted very much to Judaism. There are two answers for that. One is there are reincarnations of righteous Gentiles who wanted to convert and they couldn't. There's another reason. Some of them are actually Jewish already. They just don't know it some Ukrainian Goya. Her grandmother, her mother's mother, or the mother of her mother mother, meaning she was Jewish. And the grandmother doesn't know about it anymore. And the mother doesn't know, and she doesn't know. But she thinks she's 100% Christian. They took her to church, everything. But she has a Jewish soul. But she just, nobody ever told her that. The question the Rambam asks, why the Jews are obligated to force the Gentiles to keep the seven laws of Noah? Jews are obligated to rebuke their brothers. Ocheach, tochiach, et amitecha. A brother from your nation, you are obligated to rebuke him, to prevent him from committing sins against Hashem. But where does it say that you have to rebuke someone that is not your brother? Some Arab from Saudi Arabia. What do I have to do with him? Or some Chinese from China? How would all of a sudden became my obligation to teach him his obligation in life? 
Logically, we would say, how else would he learn? Who was going to teach him that? He didn't get Torah. So, if you would come and say what you say, well, don't worry, they'll teach each other. You teach 20, 30 of them, they'll teach thousands. The thousands will teach tens of thousands, and then they'll teach million. That's what King Solomon did in his days. He took the princesses from all the countries, taught them about the principle of the Torah, and sent them back. It was the best time in the history of the world. Most people believed in one God, 3,000 years ago. Millions of people wanted to convert to Judaism in the time of King Solomon. If today King Solomon lived, he didn't need that. He would open a Facebook page. That's it. You put some of his videos, smartest person ever lived. The Goim would stand five million a day to come to convert in the time of King Solomon. He wouldn't need to marry a thousand women and send them back to their countries to teach Torah. He would do it online. He wouldn't even have to pay thousands of dollars or shekels to promote. I made a, three months ago a film in Hebrew about Shabbat. In Hebrew. How many Hebrew speakers do you have in the world? What? 15 million maybe? Not even. Forget about what 15, not even 10 million. People that speak Hebrew. You have 15 million Jews in the whole world. At least after the Jews don't speak Hebrew. Jews from Europe, from Germany, from Russia, from America, they don't speak Hebrew. So maybe seven, eight million Jews speak Hebrew. So when you make a film about Shabbat and you post it on Facebook, what's the expectation? How many people will watch it? If you have seven million potential people that can watch it, the rest don't speak Hebrew, right? Someone who is a German, what, is it, what does he need to watch a film in Hebrew? Or American? He doesn't understand. So what's the potential? You know how many people watched it? How many views we had in two and a half months? One million views. One million views. You can go on Facebook. It's called Mekor Abracha. Mem Kuf Vav Resh. Second word, Abracha. Hey, Bet, Resh, Chaf, Hey. Why we didn't call it Shabbat? No one would want to watch it. All the Mechalelei Shabbat, ah, I heard enough. I don't want to feel guilty. So we called it in Hebrew, the source of blessing. Source of blessing, everyone wants to know what it is. Ah, wow, it's a good gimmick. Gimmick. Makor Abracha. One million views. Why we got to one million views? Other lectures don't get to one million views. Not even half of it. Because we paid money to Facebook to promote it. How much? 22,000 shekel altogether. Six, six and a half thousand dollars. You do the math. Six and a half thousand got you one million views that watched almost an hour film with all the killers, sources about what does it mean to be Mechalel Shabbat. Do you know how many of them now are Shomer Shabbat? That means each dollar exposed the film to more than 130 viewers for one dollar. <laughs> it's less than a penny a person. If you could throw pennies in the streets, thousands of them, every hour, and each person will catch it and will watch the film. That's what you have to do for the rest of your life. Take all your millions and just do it. Why? You're creating hundreds of, of new Baal Tshuva every day. Every day. 500, 700, 1,000, and uh, tons of them. Why? They want money. If we wouldn't pay, we probably have 50,000 views. That's it. Best case scenario. They limit. They don't let. They don't let it go to all the people in the page. Because I have more than 200,000 people on my Facebook pages. If every one of them is on a page would see it, I don't need their promotion. 200,000 will watch it. Few of them will share it. And few others will share it. We'll go to a million for free. But they don't let. 
In the beginning, they let. Every post we made went to who knows how many. Now it's very limited. You don't pay, we're not going to let people watch. So in the end, it all comes down to one lousy thing, money. The more money Kiruv get, the more souls we save for eternity. It's breaking the heart. Knowing there are so many rich Jews out there, and they don't care. They just don't care. I just went now to, before I came here, to say mazal tov, an engagement, a family that I, I had the school to make them ba'alei tshuva. And the family of the Khatan, I also have the school to make all of them ba'alei tshuva. And then someone introduced the Bachur Yeshiva. He lives, he learns in uh, Rabbi Rubin's in Great Neck, the Bachur, very serious Ben Torah. And the girl already grew up religious because her parents were already ba'alei tshuva before she was born. Great Shiduch, two Bukharians, serious learner, serious girl, very, very good, mamash, good ashkafa, very, very righteous. I went to say Mazal Tov there in uh, Chevy Chase over there, in that big shul. I even was able to eat good today without worry. Why? One of my ba'alei tshuva is the mashgiach there, Yitzchak Bonan, Rav Yitzchak Bonan. Strict! He won't let you eat something. He won't be very careful not to eat himself. You know, it's wonderful. You come, you don't have to check every little thing. Where the meat from, where this from, where the leather's from, where this one, where is that. Oh, you in charge. Can eat without worry. It's great. Mashgiach here in Queens. Learned Torah all day. He was in my Gemara class almost 20 years ago. In Yeshiva, I don't see now you see, 20 years later, he came to me as a bachur. Now he has four kids. His wife is a teacher in yeshiva here for kids. Build a beautiful home. Right there, between the chatan and the kala and the family of the mashgiach, right there you have more than 30, 40 people. Right there. Those people are all of them mamash beautiful tzaddikim. Who made them what they are? Everyone was donated to Kiro for the last 20 years. When they come to Shamaim, Hashem says, you see this Chatuna? It's yours. You see this Mashgiach and his children in Talmud Torah? What beautiful kids. It's yours. You see how many people don't eat refot and how it's kosher, strictly kosher, many events thanks to him? It's yours. That's what people don't get. They burn money on such stuyot. Rabbi, I'm buying a boat. We want to move to Miami. No, Beseder, how much is the boat? Over a million. What are you going to do with this boat? Sit there, here and there. Sit in a boat. No, million, with a million dollars, we make 200,000 ballet tshuva. And how much a boat costs to maintain it? So you go on a boat. So once in a while, you rent a boat, if that makes you so happy. People burn their life on shtuyot. Don't ever forget the, the, the scene in the Schindler List movie. How Oscar Schindler, the guy, in the end, that everyone complimented him for saving so many Jews, giving money to the Nazis not to kill the Jews, that he should hire them. His intention was to save their life. In the end, he started to scream, I'm nothing. This watch could have saved 10 more Jews. And this one should have saved another 50 Jews. And this car could save another 300. I don't know the exact numbers. You can see that. Before, he, before everything finished, he felt guilty. He saved hundreds of Jews from murder. But he felt that he's guilty for all those who died. That he could have saved much more if he would give up his Swiss watch. And if he would give up that car, and if he would give up this suit, started to say, what is this? Life of 20 more families. What is this watch? Another 10 people. What is this car? Another 50 people. What did it help me, all these things? I could have saved a few more hundreds. Hundreds would become tens of thousands. 
There is, I, I don't know if you saw that video that someone saved one Jew, and now they show a picture that he has more than a hundred religious people. And they brought that guy to Israel, I think a year ago. I don't know if you saw, it's an unbelievable video, you cannot stop crying. They brought some guy that saved the Jew, and now this Jew became a thousand religious people. And the guy, his eyes came out, so it's all thanks to you. The guy was crying, the people were crying, and this is only technically saving bodies. They could have been Bechlal secular, these people. Saving souls, <laughs> a trillion times more important. I want to just finish. The first lecture, I spoke in some other things that not relates directly to the series, but on the next lectures I'll be more focused on the topic only. We always need to get the background first. So the Rambam, just to answer his questions, and we'll finish here. So the Rambam says, so why Hashem gave the Jews this obligation to rebuke the, the Goyim and teach them about the seven laws? And to teach them that it's not enough that you do it because you decent Gentiles, because you have manners. That's why you don't steal and that's why you don't kill. Because we have to teach you, they have to aim in your mind that you do it because of God's word. And they would never know it without the Jews. And this is the way Hashem designed it. There's big arguments about it. The Ramban, the Ritba, the Ramban, many of Gdole Israel argue about the answer to this question. The Gemara says, where Baba Kama, page 38, also in Avodah Zarah, in the first page, two Gemarot discuss this. Amad ve'imodet eretz ra'a ve'iter goim. Shem measure the land, the earth, and allow the Gentiles to multiply and to live. Ra'a kadosh baruch hu sheva mitzvot shekiblu alem bnei noach. Hashem saw the Gentiles that keeping the seven laws. The Gemara says, Lomar, Shafilu mekaimim otam, En mekablim alehem sachar ke metzuve veose. If they keep it without knowing that it's mitzvah for them, not because God say it, they get a reward like someone does something without knowing is a mitzvah. With no intention. But if he does it with the intention, I am now intending to do the will of God, that's a whole different league, a whole different category. So what does the Rambam mean over here? Six of the seven laws were given to Adam already. Before Noah, Adam already had six laws to teach his children. The seventh one was added to Noah and repeated with the other six after the flood. Do not eat animals unless they are dead, ever minachai. This was not a problem before the flood. The flood was 4,200 years ago. All the people in the world died. The world restarted from Noah and his three sons and their wives. Eight people started a new world. Everyone was a Gentile. There's no Judaism yet. 4,200 years, it's 900 years before the Torah was given. So Hashem restarted the world and restarted the laws of Noah with addition of one more, one more commandment. Meaning the people that used to keep the six laws, they are gone, if there were any. Probably no one did, if Hashem wiped them all out. Okay. So the obligation now is 
from Adam or from Noah? If a Gentile keeps it now. This obligation is the same obligation that God gave to Adam or it really started all fresh from the time of Noah? Do you hear the question or no? The answer, it's the same obligation from Adam. Once God makes an obligation, a command, that's it. Or nobody can cancel it. Just because the people died, the obligation remains. However, it was repeated for the people to be educated in it. The Rambam says, after the temple was destroyed, do we still have the obligation of keeping Ger Toshav? If the Goim wants to stay in Israel and to be righteous Gentile and no idol worshipping, do we have an obligation to keep them today? We don't have Bet HaMikdash today. No, we don't have the temple. The answer is no. We don't have a kingdom in Israel. You may say, but we have the state of Israel. But the state of Israel is not an obligation from the Torah to have a state. Can, Jews can live in Israel as long as they keep Torah and mitzvot. But the state of Israel, is that a righteous state or a state that does everything they can to go against God? Is it a righteous state? The government of Israel, they go out of their way to spread Torah? No, they do everything they can to eliminate Torah. Are they pro-synagogues? No, they do everything they can not to let synagogue open. Are they pro-Shabbat or they want public transportation and stores and malls? They force stores to open on Shabbat and if not you get a fine. They anti-Shabbat. Are they pro-kosher food? No, they want to give everyone permission to make any certificate they want and sell any food they want. Are they pro-Judaism? Are they anti-intermarriage? Are they against assimilation? The exact opposite. They do everything they can to turn all Israelis to Goim. They promoting intermarriage. They do everything they can to make it legal. If a Jew marry a non-Jew, they give the non-Jew rights like he's a Jew. They don't care that the children are not Jewish. According to them, he's Jewish. I was sued for saying the Prime Minister is a Goy, which he is a Goy. But I lost. Why I lost? <laughs> because the judge is a liberal Rasha Merusha, like Bernie Sanders. He care about what God thinks. For me, he's a Jew. You're going to tell me that he's not. I teach Torah, and you're not teaching Torah. We make the rules here. It's not a religious state. There's nothing you can do about it. If a man and a man wants to get married, they very much like it. We give you rights. He can inherit your husband. It's sick. You and your husband will have rights. We give you social security, everything. They promote abomination. If you want to stop Abomination parades, you're gonna, you're gonna go to jail. If you demonstrate against it, the Israeli Shabbat, secret service, come to your house, confiscate your computer and your phones. You can even get arrested. Why? Because you're anti-abomination. Bottom line, from the minute Israel became a state, they do everything they can to go against God. And then they wonder, where was God in October 7th? That's what they ask. Where was he? When there was a party on Shabbat, Simchat Torah, everyone naked, drugged, drugs, alcohol, men, women, everyone naked, big Buddha, huge statues there, dancing with the Goish music on Shabbat. Instead of dancing with the Torah, dancing around an idol. Then a couple of monster Nazis to shoot them, and they ask, where was God? Where were you for, for decades? Where were you for creating such people? For people that hate Torah, people that hate rabbis, people that hate yeshivot, people who arrest rabbis, take them to interrogations, threatening them, taking information from the computer. If you say something we don't like, 
Remember, we, we got you. We watch everything you say and everything you don't say. That's the land of God? Absolutely not. That's why Rav Yoel Misat Mer Zatzal already predicted all of that 80 years ago, before the Israeli state. He already knew where this Zionist, communist, anti-God movement would lead us to. He saw, he saw their ideology. Today it explodes in our face. That's it. Now the question is, and I'm finishing here, the question here, what can be done right now? They went, they fought like Goim, they got weapon, they fought the Arabs, they kicked the Brits out. Now we have a state. We build thousands of buildings, companies, high tech, army. No, we have a state, an, an advanced state. The question is, this state is blessed in the eyes of God, or it's a pity? Hashem is proud of the state, or is upset every moment? You may say, everything there is wicked. All the laws are wicked, laws of Sodom. Everyone there is allergic to Torah. Abomination everywhere. People that learn Torah are despicable in the eyes of the, these communists. They hate Torah learners. They hate them. They want them dead. They're not hiding it. On the other hand, there are 150,000 people that sit and learn Torah all day. For sure, Hashem has mixed feelings here. When he looks at some neighborhoods in Yerushalayim, it gives him a lot of joy. When he sees the, the abomination parade in Tel Aviv, is disgusted. So how does he feel? Right? Good question or no? You're welcome to send me answers. I'm <laughs> Israchi at gmail.com. Next week I will start with this if you remind me. We'll get into that a little further. I say that for years. I say that when people didn't understand what I say. Today everybody understands what I say. But 20 years ago when I said that, people told me, what are you talking about? The Supreme Court is the biggest enemy of the Jewish history? Yeah. I said it 20 years ago. Now everybody sees what I say. It was so obvious. I'm not somebody that invented that. I mean, greater, much greater people before me already say it. They already saw it coming. I only learned from them and it brought my attention to see how much they hate Torah. The president of the Israeli Supreme Court never said one time in his life, Shema Israel, Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad, until he was 90. This wicked law life. Aaron Barak, Shem Reshaim Irkav. He didn't know how to say Shema Israel, Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad. He never held feeling in his life. 90 years. The head of the Israeli Supreme Court. And he made hundreds of ruling against Torah. Against Torah, against Yeshivot, against Judaism. Hundreds of rulings. And now he admits he has no idea what Judaism is. Such a corrupted judge. How can you rule in a subject you have no idea what it is? Always negging, against, 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 against. What's going on here? I can be a judge uh, in the high-tech industry? No. If two companies would argue with me about patent that they have, I cannot be a judge. I don't know anything about high tech. Imagine 40 years I'm a judge in high tech and I force people to do what I want and I have no idea what high tech is. Can you find a bigger despicable criminal more than me? How do you push your nose into something you don't know what it is? You have no idea. You don't know how to say Shema Israel. You don't know how to say Baruch Atah Hashem Shakol Nia Bidvaro. You don't know. How do you rule in Jewish religious subject? How do you decide who is Jewish and who is not when you don't know one verse in Judaism to say? Every Arab construction worker knows more Judaism than you, Arabs. And you want to rule in Judaism? <laughs> and he said in an interview, unfortunately I don't have any knowledge in Judaism. Nothing, didn't know how to reach my Israel. 
He's not the only one. Other judges are just as bad. Fifteen low lives sitting there, fighting Hashem, do not know what the Torah is. Never read one page in the Torah. Such ignorant people, clowns, clowns. Something like this would happen in America. A judge wants to rule against the New Testament. Right away, they ask him, do you know Christianity? Never heard about it in my life. How you push your nose to decide if Catholic is right or Protestant is right? How do you want to rule if you never read the book once in your life? It would be the joke of the town. Joke of the town. And there are things that are even worse than that. So the question is, what does Hashem think about us? Is he stuck with us because we forced him? And he has to defend his children. He doesn't want a holocaust in the holy land with millions are dead. But he keeps punishing us every day as we see. Oh, he's very happy. Why? There's a lot of good things also in Israel. Chesed, Gmachim, Yeshivot, Torah. Almost two million people keep Shabbat. Synagogues, people sing, retailing, kids come with their parents, they learn. Very, very big dilemma. You have a son, helps you, respect you. On the other hand, steal from you, doing drugs. Doing, uh, you don't know what to do. Sh should I like this guy? Should I hate this guy? What's going on here? One minute he's an angel, a minute later he's the angel of death. We as people, if someone will do 90% good to us and 10% bad, we can look at them. We will hate them very much. If someone will prove to you that they do 90% good, they save you, they help you, you made tons of money thanks to them. So once in a while they insult you. Once in a while they make you lose some. But overall they help you a lot more than they damage you. It doesn't matter, I can look at him. Why? Remember what I told you about the ceiling? The entire ceiling is perfect. One piece is missing, that's all you see. The negative. But Hashem is not like that. He's very calculated. He can put on a scale the situation in Israel, see all the Torah, see all the good, see all the horrible things that happen. And the scale can turn into the positive side. You understand what I'm saying or no? Remind me next Monday, we'll start with this. Baruch Adonai Le'olam. Amen ve'amen. Rabbi Hanani Aben Akashia Omer Ratsa Gadosh Baruch Hu Lezakot Et Yisrael. לפיכך הרבה להם תורה ומצוות שנאמר אדוני חפץ למען צדקו יגדיל תורה ויאדיר